Meditations on the Psalms. Psalm chapter 1 Jesus, the Son of Man, is here presented in his personal holiness and integrity, and then in his rewards. As the tree planted by the rivers of water. See Jeremiah 17, these rewards awaited Jesus in his resurrection. And will still await him in his kingdom or the judgment, and there the righteous will share his rewards and the wicked be no more. This psalm is very soothing to the soul. It is the godly man in the care and leading of God, whom we see before us. No other intrudes to disturb the rest and security of the righteous one, but on he goes, in his proper undistracted path, to his reward. And it is gracious to see this book, which is the great depository of the exercises of the soul, open with so tender and soothing a picture as this. The godly man's portion in the favor of the Lord, finding his happiness there. And our souls should ever move on in the like happiness. The Israel of the last days, the godly remnant, will have their place here also. Psalm chapter 2 Here, however, the soothing influence of the previous psalm is not felt, it is altogether broken up, for the world enters the scene. It is no longer the privacy of God and the godly man. That path is in this psalm trespassed upon by the rude and wild foot of an evil persecuting world. It is, suffering and glory, that we get here, the rage of man against the Lord's anointed, but the Lord's triumphant exaltation of him. Jesus, the Christ of God, is presented in his grace and power, and consequently the vanity of resisting him, and the blessedness of trusting in him. The confederacy, which is here anticipated, was formed when Jesus was crucified. See Acts 4, he will punish it when he returns in his kingdom. See Luke chapter 19, it is still in principle existent, being the course of this world already judged, but spared through divine long-suffering. It will be fully developed in all its forms of evil in the last days, those days which the Psalms so generally belong to. It acts on the old desire, and the lie of the serpent. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5, it would dethrone God. For the present, however, he that sits in the heavens laughs at it all, as was expressed by the angel rolling away the stone, and sitting on it, while he put the sentence of death into the hearts of its keepers. Matthew chapter 28, what was all that but the Lord telling the confederacy which had crucified Jesus that he had them all in derision? In like spirit the Lord Jesus from the heavens challenged Saul, the persecuting zealot, in Acts 9. But there is much more than this present laughter. For the decree of God touching the Christ is the great counter-scheme, and will of course prevail. And that decree, as here announced by the Lord himself, gives him sonship and inheritance. Sonship is already his by resurrection, Acts 13, inheritance will be his in glory by and by. Note. Looking at these psalms together, it is Jesus under the law, approved of God and earning blessing by his righteousness, whom we may see in the first, Jesus in testimony or as anointed. Resisted by man but exalted by God, and securing blessing or executing judgment on others, whom we see in the second. Psalm chapter 3 This psalm is the devout meditation of an afflicted servant of God. It was probably the experience of David, but the Spirit of Jesus breathes in it. It is a morning meditation or prayer, and the afflicted one appears to take courage from his now awaking in safety, anticipating from this, as a pledge or sample, the morning of his kingdom when all his enemies shall be taken away. This morning rising of the godly man, as the pledge of the opening of the kingdom, is sweet and striking, for the kingdom will be near at hand when those last days have come, and the remnant are manifested. Psalm chapter 4 This meditation is the companion of the preceding one. It is an evening prayer of the same godly man. He appears to have passed through a trying day, as was every day to Jesus more or less, but to have been sustained and refreshed in it. The godly man, as here, may go to bed and sleep, v. 8, but he warns others to go to bed, and there commune with their hearts, and search their spirits, v. 4. He knows his own full title to rest in God undisturbed, for God giveth his beloved sleep. The Lord Jesus realized this, though winds and waves tossed the ship on the Sea of Galilee. See Mark 4, Psalm chapter 5 This psalm is still in connection. It is a meditation by night. See verse 3, thus it follows the preceding. In it the same godly man looks on the evil powers that war against him, but anticipates his victory and deliverance. But whether it be morning, evening, or night, these psalms show the pattern of a full faith in God. Different fruit because a different season. As Jesus could weep, and could rejoice in spirit. Every season found in him its due fruit, and all was beautiful, for all was in its season.
he knew in what spirit to take his journey to the holy hill in Matthew chapter 17, and in what spirit to set himself on the road to Jerusalem for the last time. See Mark chapter 10 verse 32, he knew how to be abased and how to abound, and each perfectly. Psalm chapter 6 This is another meditation by night. CV, 6, but it is of deeper sorrow than the fifth. It was mystically midnight, and in it the same one pleads to be delivered from the grave. And he pleads against the power of death on the ground that, if death close the scene, God will be forgotten, for he is not the God of the dead. See Isaiah chapter 38, but there is an anticipation of the same deliverance and victory as in the fifth. All these psalms strongly intimate that the godly man who is heard in him is living in the last days of Israel's sorrow, and on the eve of deliverance and the kingdom. And in spirit Jesus was in those days. Psalm chapter 7 In the progress of this mystic season, we now in this psalm reach the dawn. Accordingly Jehovah is called to arise and awake, v. 6, as though it were time for him to set to his hand for the deliverance of his righteous persecuted ones. It is still the breathing of the Spirit of Jesus, but, as in each of these, in company with his remnant in the latter day. But here, as the day approaches, he still more largely and more gloriously anticipates the destruction of the great enemy, his falling into the ditch that he made for others, which event, like the dawn, is the harbinger of the day, for it shall be followed by the gathering of the congregation around the Lord, as is here looked for. Psalm chapter 8 This psalm closes this mystic season, for now we reach the second morning, the eighth or resurrection day. The opening of the kingdom or the day of the Lord. It needs no commentary to show or prove this. See Hebrews chapter 2 This is the morning anticipated by Jesus or by the godly one at his rising up from sleep in Psalm chapter 3. It is the praise which had been just previously vowed. See Psalm chapter 7 verse 17. The wicked having now come to an end, and the congregation having been gathered. The Lord quotes it in reference to the Hosanna's asterisk which welcomed him on his royal visitation to Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 21 verse 16, for those Hosannas were, in spirit or in principle, the praises of the kingdom, as this psalm is. And creation joins the chorus. In Psalm chapter 2 we saw the royalty of Messiah, Son of David, Son of God, here we see the Lordship of the Son of Man, his dominion over the works of God. All these his glories will be realized and displayed in millennial days. Note, according to this we might pause here, and read Psalms 3 to 8 in connection, leading the worshipper, in spirit, into the kingdom. And others have observed that our history every 24 hours, the period passed thus in these Psalms, is in like manner a kind of mystery. For after spending the day, at night we lay aside our clothes and enter into sleep, the emblem of death, and there abide with visions in the spirit, till the morning wakes us. And then we are clothed again, as we shall be in the second morning, or the morning of the resurrection and glory. Note, I must add another short notice. 1 Corinthians 15 27 and 28, illustrates the way in which ulterior scriptures enlarge upon, without disturbing, preceding scriptures. The Apostle establishes every syllable of the psalmist, giving Christ dominion according to Psalm chapter 8. But then he goes onward. For the psalmist had left, as well as put, the universal lordship or kingdom in Christ's hand, but the Apostle, reasoning upon the force of the psalmist's words, is instructed by the same Spirit to reveal a scene of glory which lay beyond the kingdom thus left by the psalmist in the hand of Christ. Psalm chapter 9 This psalm manifests itself very clearly. It is Messiah leading the praise of his righteous people in the latter day for the Lord's destruction of the great enemy, and the consequent anticipated enthronement of Messiah in Zion. There is also a fine insultation over the enemy now thus fallen, kindred with that which the Spirit of Christ breathes in the prophet Isaiah over the king of Babylon, Isaiah chapter 14, and a recital of the cry of the afflicted ones in the day of their calamity. The world is also declared as learning righteousness from God's judgments in the latter day, verse 16, as in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 9. And the nature of those judgments also, the taking of the wicked in their own snare. As in Psalm chapter 7 verse 10, Psalm chapter 35, Psalm chapter 57, Psalm chapter 94, Psalm chapter 109, Psalm chapter 112. Haman's destruction is the type of this Esther chapter 7, and 10, and the cross is gloriously the illustration of the same, for there by death he that had the power of death was destroyed. The falling and perishing of the enemy at the presence of God, v. 5, is strikingly illustrated in scripture, in days of divine visitation or judgment. 
See Psalm chapter 94, Exodus chapter 14 verse 24 and 25, John chapter 18 verse 6, here it is anticipated in the doom and downfall of the great infidel or anti-Christian enemy of the last day. See Revelation chapter 19, how awfully will the nations then learn themselves to be, but men, verse 20, though they had been drinking in and practicing the old lie of the serpent. Ye shall be as gods. Psalm chapter 10 This psalm must be read in connection with the ninth. The cry of the remnant is given more largely, and the iniquity of the enemy more fully detailed. The answer to the cry, and then the establishment of the kingdom, is beautifully anticipated at the close. Atheistic pride, man becoming his own god, man learning no lessons of god, either in grace or judgment, and the persecution of the righteous, strongly give character to this last form of evil. And then some marks are set upon the great enemy of the last days, in all parts of scripture, wherever he is glanced at or anticipated, prophetically or typically. Note. In the Septuagint Psalms 9, and 10 are but 1. Consequently from Psalm chapter 10 to Psalm chapter 147 the number of the psalm in the Septuagint is one less than in the authorized English version. In Psalm chapter 147 the number became the same again, because that psalm becomes 2 in the Septuagint. Psalm chapter 11 This is the meditation of a soul in great outward perplexity. The natural securities of the righteous, the foundations, of the social order, kings and judges, see Psalm chapter 82, Romans chapter 13, are giving way. But God is still in his due place, that is the soul's relief. Let God be true, but every man a liar. It is the utterance of the afflicted remnant in the last days. But Jesus was their pattern and forerunner in his sorrows from the hand of man. How different, we may observe, is the world which faith apprehends, from that which sense or sight converses with. The world seen is here declared to be all out of course, the wicked prospering, the righteous oppressed. But faith apprehends a scene where God is in all the sanctity and calmness and power of a throne and a temple, his soul loving the righteous, hating the wicked, and preparing judgments for them when the trial of the righteous is over. Such were the two scenes or worlds opened at the beginning of Job. In the seen or felt world, the adversary was doing his pleasure, in the unseen place the God of all grace was sovereignly preparing blessing for his saint. Moses walked as, seeing him who is invisible. Psalm chapter 12 This is another meditation, together with a prayer of a righteous one set in the midst of abounding evil. And that evil is evidently the evil that is to be ripe and full in the last days, as we have just seen anticipated in the preceding psalm. Infidel scoffing, such as that foretold as marking the last days, 2 Peter chapter 3, is the principal feature of it. The mourner, however, hears in spirit the Lord's answer to his prayer, verse 5, then celebrates the faithfulness of his words, that they were all tried and proved words. And finally professes his assurance that God's faithfulness will prevail even in the worst of times. This generation, in verse 7 is described in verse 8. This word is, therefore, used in a moral sense. Indeed it must be so used from the force of the words, forever. The people or generation with which both the Lord Jesus and the remnant contend in their several days. A morally one and the same, generation. And from this we can interpret Matthew chapter 24 verse 34 in a moral way. Perhaps there is tacit reference there to this passage. Psalm chapter 13 The cry of a soul put to sore trial of patience, but patience is having, its perfect work, for this soul trusts in mercy, and by the anticipation of faith sings of salvation. Such was Jesus in the fullest sense, he who was daily, acquainted with grief. But the patient waiting remnant of the same last days are heard here. It is prepared for them. These words in the Psalms, how long, and, forever, frequently express this trial of patience. His mercy endureth forever, will be the changed style of the worshipper when the patience is over and the kingdom is come. Psalm chapter 14 This psalm gives us the solitary musing of a godly soul over the atheism of the world. He recites God's verdict, verses 3, 4, upon man after making a solemn inquisition, such as he made of old at Babel and at Sodom, Genesis chapter 11 verse 5, Genesis chapter 18 verse 21, then anticipates the confusion of the children of men. When God shows himself in the midst of his generation, thus morally opposed to the generation of Psalm chapter 12 verse 7 and 8, and closes with uttering a desire for that occasion. The willful king of the last days is surely contemplated in the fool or atheist of this psalm, for the confederacy which he heads is to be broken up when the salvation here anticipated comes out of Zion.
but man is man. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And thus the apostle can quote this psalm. When describing men in Romans chapter 3, for all of us by nature have the mind of the willful one, or the atheist, alienated from the life of God. Ephesians chapter 4, thus, while this is the meditation of either Jesus or his remnant, looking on the infidel of the last days, every instructed soul may use it. See Psalm chapter 53, indeed, the language of verse 3 in the Septuagint is used by the Apostle in Romans chapter 3 verse 11 to 18. Psalm chapter 15 This little psalm seems to present the righteous in the days of the fool, the remnant in the time of the last apostate faction. Verses 2 to the 5th of may be read as the divine oracle replying to the prophet's inquiry in verse 1 It is not the sinner's title to the kingdom which is here discussed. That would be treated very differently. It is the remnant, as manifesting themselves in righteousness, in contrast with the evildoers of Psalm chapter 14. See the same thing in Isaiah chapter 33 verse 15 and 16. It is character and not title that is the subject. Of course it need not be said, that the title of all is one and the same, the worthy and accepted blood of Jesus. Note. This psalm may be considered as closing a series of meditations and experiences which opened with Psalm chapter 11. For they are all the utterances of a soul burdened with a sense of the wickedness of the day, and calling with desire on God, and as clearly and surely the last days are contemplated. And those utterances are of the remnant, then. The challenge in Burr. The first of may bring to mind similar language in Psalm chapter 24 verse 3. But there the answer given to it, at the close of the psalm, introduces Messiah himself much more distinctly and personally than it does here. By this I am also reminded of Revelation chapter 5 verse 2. For we have a challenge there likewise. Who is worthy to open the book, and to loose the seals thereof? And the glorious answer there given again introduces Messiah, only in still fuller and richer and sublimer characters, as the Lamb that had been slain. And the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Psalm chapter 16 we know from the Holy Ghost, in Acts chapter 2 verse 31, that this psalm is the utterance of Jesus through David. It is the language of the Lord consciously dwelling in God's house as a priest or worshipper. Accordingly he will have no other God, and take his inheritance, like a priest, Numbers chapter 18 verse 20, only from God, esteeming it the best, and in constant communion find confidence and joy and praise and hope. And the very first act of this worshipper is to trust in the Lord, owning that he cannot profit the Lord, for the Lord must profit him. See the contradiction of this in Israel's worship, Psalm chapter 2 and in the Gentiles' worship, Acts 17. It is easy and natural to call to mind here the answer of the Lord to the young ruler in Luke chapter 18. In the moral perfectness of the place he took, the Son in flesh could talk of God as the only good one. Though it is true, that the Lord was not our priest till he rose, Hebrews chapter 5, and 8, nor took official services of such a character on him, yet he was a priest to God, or a worshipper. All through his life on earth, showing all the personal virtues of such an one, walking always in a sanctuary, and always taking God as his portion. And what incense, what constant perfect incense, was the life of Jesus thus looked at? What sweet savour of a meat offering was all that he ever did or said? Thine Holy One, is the flesh of Jesus. Acts chapter 2 verse 27, and 31, this title for it arises from Luke chapter 1 verse 35, which separated the human nature of Jesus from all taint, and kept it in the fullest favor and acceptance with God. Psalm chapter 17 this, on the other hand, is the utterance of Jesus, not consciously dwelling in the house of the Lord, but as having come forth and met the oppositions of men. But as he had within carried himself in the sanctity of a worshipper, so here outside he is keeping himself from all evil in the midst of all, and in the confidence of this integrity. Looking for vindication from God's presence, and the rewards of righteousness in resurrection by and by, when his persecutors, who are of the world, and have their portion in this life, shall be cast down. The persecuted righteous remnant may also utter this in company with Jesus, indeed they seem to be introduced very distinctly, verse 11. Note, these two psalms thus present the experiences of the Lord very differently. In Psalm chapter 16 he enters into all the present joy of being a dweller in God's house, a priest or worshipper who felt that his lines had fallen in pleasant places. Because he was inside the house with God. In Psalm chapter 17 he is outside in the trial of the world, meeting the oppositions of men, and seeking help and deliverance, and looking only to future things as his joy. 
in 16 the resurrection comes as the end of a blessed path, in 17 as relief from a trying and dangerous one. The experiences of his saints are according to this also. At times it is the simple joy of resurrection, and at times the hope of being relieved by that from many a present burden which fills their souls. To be within the veil, and at the same time outside the camp, is the due attitude of the believer, and full of moral beauty and dignity that is. Psalm chapter 18 This is Messiah's praise for deliverance or resurrection, which had been expected at the close of the preceding psalm. He celebrates Jehovah as his rock and his horn, symbols of strength and royalty. He recites his desires in the day of his distress, and the marvelous redemption which the hand of Jehovah had wrought for him and his Israel, when in the place of death. Or amid the confederations of his enemies in the latter day. His deliverance is God's answer to his cry. The earth then shakes, as the place of assembly shook at the voice of the church in Jerusalem. Acts 4, for the judge of all the earth will avenge his own elect that cry to him. The spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming will do this. Verses 8, 12, 2 Thessalonians 2-8, this psalm strikingly shows Christ in two places and two very distinct characters. For he is here both the delivered one and the deliverer. He is the one who makes this supplication, and the one who answers it. All this, of course, simply and necessarily arising from his person, divine and human as it is, from his being one with his afflicted people, and yet the Lord who rescues and blesses them. As we see him in Isa. 8. Waiting on Jehovah who has turned his face from Israel, and in Matthew chapter 23 Jehovah himself with his face turned away. David's deliverance from the hand of Saul was the type of this, and the deliverance of Israel, with whom Messiah here identifies himself, in the latter day will be the real deliverance here celebrated by the prophetic spirit. The rescue of Israel from the Red Sea, where the strength of Pharaoh perished, is referred to, verses 15, AMD 16, for that was another typical resurrection or deliverance. So the discomfiture of Adonizedek, who was the type of the last enemy or the willful king in the days of Joshua, is also glanced at in verse 12. See also Psalm chapter 144, Isaiah chapter 30 verse 27 to 33, and Isaiah chapter 64 verse 1 to 3, and the delivered one becomes the conquering and the reigning one at the close. The Lord strengthening him, he seems the same hand of God that rescues him, gives him victory, and at last invests him with dominion. It lights his candle, and makes him run through a troop. And thus this psalm tells us, as Paul teaches in Romans chapter 8, whom he justified, them he also glorified. For the Lord does not, cannot, stop with mere deliverance. But goes on to perfect his goodness in the kingdom. The song of Israel in Exodus chapter 15 and that of the elders in Revelation chapter 5 utter the same truth. If he translate us into the kingdom of his dear son, it is as putting us on the sure and ready way to the inheritance of the saints in light. Colossians chapter 1, he perfects that which concerneth us. But all this is in favor of the righteous, 20 to 27, paying just judgment to others. That is the character of the action here. For the deliverance from, the violent man, will not be so much in grace as in righteousness. The sinner is delivered only in grace, through atonement, from the curse of the accuser, the penalty of sin, and the just judgment of the law. And so the Israel of God in the day of their repentance by and by. But in conflict with the enemy, they will be righteous as David with Saul. They will suffer as martyrs or as righteous ones, and as such they will be delivered. And this just judgment, this reward of righteousness and of evil, is the character of the action in the book of Revelation, see Revelation chapter 22 verse 11, and 15, as it is of this psalm. 2 Samuel 22 shows us that this psalm was the utterance of David in a fitting time, and though I have just noticed it above, I may urge it again here. What a proof does this offer of the typical nature of certain pieces of history. For the deliverance of David from the hand of Saul is here published in such a style as tells us plainly that another and far more magnificent deliverance was looked at through it. Hannah's song, in like manner, looks beyond the occasion of it. 1 Samuel 2, nothing is more common than this. And this is judged by some to be the meaning of those words, no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. 2 Peter chapter 1, all individual events are parts of one great system of divine government. Psalm chapter 19, this is the meditation of a true worshipper of God, honoring him both in his works and his word. The Gentiles should, but did not, Romans chapter 1, have known God from his works, and Israel should, but did not, Romans chapter 2, have kept his word or his law.
the true worshipper here, therefore, condemns both, and glorifies God in his two great ordinances or testimonies. The works and the word of God have these two qualities, they glorify God and bless the creature, as this psalm shows. Thus, the firmament declares the divine handiwork, but it also carries the sun which gives its heat to all creation. So the law is perfect, thus glorifying its maker like the firmament, but it also converts the soul. God's glory and his creature's blessing are equally cared for in the great scenes of divine power and wisdom. But there is no effort, no indisposedness in the earth to receive blessing from the heavens, but man is to stir himself up, as the psalmist here does. To get the blessing to his soul which the law or the word carries for him. This psalm is referred to, Romans chapter 10 verse 18, by the apostle for the purpose of gloriously identifying the ministries of the heavens and of the gospel. The service which one renders the earth is like that which the other renders the world, both so diffusing themselves everywhere that nothing may be hid from either the fertilizing or saving heat thereof. The ministry of the heavens to the earth, in its universality, is the pattern of that of the gospel to the world. And the Lord in his own divine ministry was just this also. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and that light lighteth every man in the world. John chapter 1 verse 4, and 9, such was the competency or quality of the light or the ministry of the Son of God. In principle it reached all. Nothing in creation is hid from the heat of the sun, and no man in the world from the testimony of the gospel. Colossians chapter 1 verse 23, note. We get notices of presumptuous sins in Numbers 15 and Deuteronomy chapter 17, and I believe that when we come to the scriptures of the New Testament we see them in Hebrews chapter 6 and 10. Psalm chapter 20 I read this psalm as the utterance of the Jewish remnant exercising very lively faith in their Messiah in the day when he will take their trouble upon himself and come forth to assert his kingdom against his and their enemy. They accordingly commend him to the care of Jehovah, and anticipate his victory, and that they themselves shall therefore, like their fathers, Exodus chapter 17 verse 15, have a banner in Jehovah, though in conflict with the true Amalek. The people in this spirit commended Joshua to God's care as he was going out to his battles. Joshua chapter 1 verse 17 and 18, and according to the divine ordinance, when Israel went out to battle, they were to encourage themselves in God, and not be afraid of the multitudes, of the enemy or of their chariots and their horses. See Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 1, Jesus, as one fully obedient to this ordinance, here goes forth to the warfare in this spirit. In the full power of verse 3 we see our Lord leaving his priestly services in heaven, now that he is about to take this other service. This duty of the God of battles, the Redeemer of the inheritance, upon him. And this present action, his going forth in due season against his enemies, had been pledged to him as soon as he took his seat in heaven. See Psalm chapter 110 verse 1, and he had been expecting it. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 13, Psalm chapter 21 This is a continuation of the language of the remnant which we had in the preceding psalm. They first address Jehovah, owning that they have a full and glorious anticipation of the victory of their king, and of his establishment in his kingdom, because he had trusted in him, his God. See Psalm chapter 18 verse 2 and 3, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 13, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, then, in what may be called the second part, beginning with verse 8, they address Messiah as still in the heavens. But telling him as it were of his coming victories, and they close by desiring his exaltation, owning him Lord. His crown is one of pure gold, verse 3, that is, of unsullied righteousness, and therefore his kingdom such as will last, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 and 9, length of days forever and ever, verse 4. David was the type of the true king thus in victory. And David's desire was fulfilled. 2 Samuel 7 19, as here Messiah's is in verse 4. Psalm chapter 110, I may observe, is another instance of a worshipper addressing Jehovah and Christ by turns, as he sees them gloriously seated in the heavens. What characters of communion are our souls entitled to? What discoveries of heaven as it now is does scripture make to us? What sights of glories yet to come do we get there? Psalm chapter 22 This psalm was the language of the soul of the Lord while he hung on the cross. Matthew chapter 27 verse 46, he uttered, perhaps, only the first words of it, but his spirit went through the whole. He begins as though his cries for deliverance from death, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, had not been heard, since he was now under the darkness of the withdrawn countenance of God. This was the death of a victim, not of a martyr. It was death under the judgment of sin.
nothing ever could be of like kind. See how the death of the martyr Stephen is different from that of the Lamb of God. Acts 7 But still the perfect sufferer entirely vindicates God, the faithful God of the fathers, and his God from the womb hitherto. He therefore still cries, presenting all the features of his present distress from the hand of men before the eye of God. See verses 7, 8, 12, 16, 17, and 18, and it is strange, how the enemies, in that hour, were fulfilling the word of God against themselves to the very letter of it. CV 8 and Matthew chapter 27 verse 43, but at last the blessed sufferer seems conscious of having been heard, verse 21, heard from the horns of the unicorns, heard, doubtless, by him who was able to save him from death. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, for we may observe that the cry of Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, was after an interval followed by another, Father. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. That second cry would naturally arise from a consciousness of the first having been heard. And it may therefore be thought that the Lord here in verse 21 expresses his sense of having been heard by his deliverer from death. Under this he makes his vows, first, to declare God's name to his brethren, second, to praise him in the congregation of Israel, and in the great congregation of all the nations. The first he began to pay immediately on his being delivered from death, John chapter 20 verse 17, and is still fulfilling in all the saints, Romans chapter 8 verse 15. The second he will pay in the kingdom when Israel and the nations are gathered, the seed of Jacob glorifying God, and the kindreds of the nations worshipping before him. For then, as Jesus here pledges, the kingdom and all its offerings shall be the Lord's. But upon this psalm, I must further observe, that while the Lord Jesus in the days of his life and ministry on earth was saving and not judging, stooping down and writing on the ground as though he heard not rather than casting a stone at a guilty one. Yet he did refer the world in its wickedness to the judicial eye and observance of God. In John chapter 17 he does this, when he says, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. This same thing he seems to me to do in this very peculiar and affecting psalm.